video, we continue with chapter six, and we are going to be looking at properties of linear transformations and more examples of linear transformations. So let's take a look at theorem 6.1. So T is a mapping from V onto W, and we're going to say that T is a linear transformation, so it satisfies our two properties for linear transformations. And U and V are going to be vectors in V then these four properties hold. So the first property is that the T of the zero vector is the zero vector. The second property is that T of negative V is the same as negative T of V. The third property is that T of U minus V is the same as T of U minus T of V. And the fourth property is that if V is a linear combination of V1 through Vn, meaning V equals C1 V1 plus C2 V2 uh, plus all the way through Cn Vn. Then T of V is going to be T of this linear combination is going to equal each scalar multiplied by T of the V. So the first term would be scalar C1 multiplied by T of V1 plus scalar C2 multiplied by T of V2 all the way through scalar Cn multiplied by T of Vn. So let's take a look at the proof of these four properties. So the first property is here. So to prove the first property, note that zero times any vector is a zero vector. So then it follows that T of zero equals zero times V uh, equals the scalar zero pulled out multiplied by T of V, which is just gonna be zero for us. Now let's take a look at the second property. So uh, that follows from our scalar property. So negative V is just the scalar negative one times V. And so that implies that T of negative V is T of negative one times V. And we know from our property of linear transformations that negative can be pulled out front. So negative one times T of V or negative T of V is equal to that. And then our third property. So we can rewrite U minus V as U plus negative V. And then our uh, second property from the definition of linear transformations follows. So we say T of U minus V is T of U plus negative one times V. Um, and then by the linearity, we can say this is T of U plus negative one times T of V or T of U minus T of V. Let's take a look at property four. So we're gonna do a proof by induction. So this is where we're saying T of the linear combination equals each scalar multiplied by T of V1 uh, through Vn. And so we're gonna start by assuming by that second property of linearity that if you've got just N as one here, we know T of C1 multiplied by V1 is equal to C1 uh, multiplied by T of V1. So then we're gonna suppose it's true for the first N elements here. And then we're gonna look at what if we had an n plus one term. So then we know since it's true for n elements, this is gonna be uh, T of the linear combination plus T of C n plus one V n plus one. So that's that first property of the linearity. And then we you know we can factor out the C ones because we suppose it was true for n. So that's why this says by supposition. So that's since true for n assumption. And so we have this last term here, but by the second property of linearity, we can factor out the Cn plus one uh, scalar. So then this last term is Cn plus one multiplied by T of Vn plus one. So then we've got our quality here for the fourth property. So this property for theorem 6.1 tells us that a linear transformation is completely determined by its action on a basis for V. So in other words, if V1 through Vn is a basis for V, and if T of V1 through T of Vn are known, then T of V is determined for any vector V in vector space, capital V. All right, let's take a look at an example. So we're gonna let T be a mapping from R3 to R3, and it's gonna be a linear transformation such that T of 1, 0, 0 is 3, 1, 4, and T of zero, one zero is one five nine, and T of zero zero one is two six five. So we're going to use property four now to find T of two seven one. 
So that means we've got to write 271 as a linear combination of the uh, first uh, values we're given here. So notice those first three values that T is acting on are just the basis vectors, right? This is just good old, we call it E1, E2, and E3 here, our standard basis. So then we just take our scalars two times T of E1 plus seven times T of E2 plus one times T of E3, where I'm pulling two, seven, and one from the first, second, and third position. And then we replace our T of E1, T of E2, and T of E3 with the values given here. So it's going to be two times uh, 314 plus seven times 159 plus one times 265. So if you want to see the intermediate steps here, that'll be six to eight. If my math is right, then we'll have seven, 30. Five and seven and nine is that 63 plus no, that can't be 63 here, or I made a mistake in my calculations down here. Uh, either way, and then plus uh, one times two, we're gonna have two, six, and five. I think this should be 68. You can double check and see if my maths are a little bit off. Everything else looks okay. Yeah, double check the maths here. Um, these numbers look all wrong. So I might've made a calculation error here so you can double check, but you see how uh, this would work. So checking with a calculator, I get the value should be 15 and then 2 plus 35 plus 6 is 43 and then the last term 8 plus 63 plus 5 is 76. Okay so you can verify if I calculated right or not but the overall uh, setup and calculations are correct here. Okay, let's look at another example. We're gonna look at a mapping from R2 to R3. And so we're gonna define that as T of V equals matrix A times vector V, where matrix A here is a three by two matrix. And so that's gonna take, because it's three by two, that's gonna take a vector from R2 and map it to R3. So we wanna show that this is a linear function and then we're gonna find T of one zero and T of zero one. And that one zero is our basis vector E1 for R2 and zero one's our basis, our standard basis vector E2 for R2. So for any U and V in R2, then we know T of U plus V is gonna be matrix A times U plus V, uh, which is the same as matrix A times U plus matrix A times V which is T of U plus T of V. That's based on the fact that uh, matrix multiplication allows this. So we've shown the first property of uh, linear transformations. And then we also, for any V in R2 and any scalar C, know from matrix properties that uh, A of CV, you can factor out the scalar C. So this is C multiplied by matrix A times V or C of TV. So we've shown the second property of linear transformations. So we can say here T is a linear transformation. So now we're gonna find T of one zero, basis vector E1, and then we'll find T of zero one. So we do this through matrix multiplication. So you can verify if we multiply A times one zero, we're just gonna get the first column of A. So T of one zero is uh, the vector seven, negative four, negative six in R3. So note, okay, now we've gone from R2 to a three tuple in R3. And then A multiplied by the vector zero one is gonna give us the second column of A. So our vector here, is a three tuple five, negative three, negative seven, also in R3. 
So notice because we use the basis vectors E1 and E2, that these are just the first and second columns of matrix A. So now let's take a look at theorem 6.2. This is about how we can use a matrix with a linear transformation. So we're gonna let A be an M by N matrix. Then our function T that maps from Rn to Rm uh, is gonna be defined as T of V equals A times the vector V. It's a linear transformation. So the vectors in Rn are represented by n by one column matrices, and the vectors in Rm are represented by m by one column matrices. So we can see uh, here is T of V, where A here is the m by n matrix, and then uh, vectors V1 through Vn are n by one. And then we end up with the m by uh, n, Uh, what do we have here? Uh, yeah, M by N matrix. And then the vectors in RM are gonna be the M by one column matrices here. So uh, you can look back at the example we just did to get an understanding of why this is true. Um, we will not prove this for now, but you intuitively, I think, understand why it's true. So let's look at an example of this in action. So rotation, uh, so we are gonna show that the linear transformation represented by this matrix A with the cosine negative sign in the first row and sine theta and cosine theta in the second row uh, maps from R2 to R2, but it rotates every vector in R2 counterclockwise by angle theta uh, about the origin as the center. So let's look at if we have T of R cosine alpha and R sine alpha, and then we multiply that vector by A here. So you can see here's angle alpha over here. Then we end up adding theta. So we end up adding over here. And so we get R, which is our radius, the length of the radius here, cosine uh, theta plus alpha for the first coordinate or the X coordinate here. So you can think about this as R cosine theta plus alpha. And then the y coordinate here is going to be r sine theta plus alpha. So you can see how through the matrix calculations, this works out quite nicely. And then observe that t is a linear transformation. So it preserves a vector addition and the scalar multiplication. And so here in this image, you can see if we've got u and v here and here, you can see u plus v is this vector through here. Uh, you can see 1.5 times Z would stretch vector V. And then the same thing for the output T of V, if you multiply it by 1.5, it's just gonna stretch it. T of U plus V uh, is the same as T of U plus T of V. So you can see, oh yeah, if I add up T of U and T of V, I'm gonna get that T of U plus V uh, in between them. So we can visually see the linear transformation properties held there. So let's look at an example of projection. So the linear transformation T from R3 to R3 represented by this matrix, um, one, zero, zero in the first row, zero, one, zero in the second row, and all zeros in the third row, is gonna project a vector V from X, Y, Z onto T of V is X, Y, and zero. So in other words, T maps every vector in R3 to its orthogonal projection in the plane. So we're taking a 3D vector and projecting it into the XY plane. Another example is a transpose. So the linear transformation of matrix M uh, and M by N matrix to matrix M and M by N matrix given by T of A equals A transpose is also a linear transformation. So if A and B are M by N matrices, then T of A plus B equals T, sorry, just equals A plus B transpose. And then we know from matrix properties that's A transpose plus B transpose, which is just T of A plus T of B. And then if A is an M by N matrix and C is a scalar, parentheses there, T of C of A is C of A transpose. 
now, uh, C multiplied by T of A. All right, here's another example. It's called the differential operator. So uh, we are gonna call it C prime, or sometimes it's called C1 of uh, the interval, closed interval AB. And so that's gonna be the set of all functions whose derivatives are continuous on the interval AB. So that prime or the one is indicating that first derivative is continuous. So we show that the differential operator D sub X defines a linear transformation from C prime of AB onto C of AB, where C of AB is all the continuous function. So using operator notation, we're gonna say the differential operator D sub X of F is just the derivative of the function F, where F is in C prime of AB. So the set of all functions whose derivatives are continuous. So from calculus, we know that functions uh, f and g in this set of uh, continuous derivatives have the property that the derivative of f plus g is the same as the derivative of f plus the derivative of g. And so we can say, well, that's just uh, an operating notation d sub x of f plus d sub x of g. And so those are in the continuous functions. So that is the first property of linear transformations shown. And then we have to think about scalars. So we know the uh, derivative of C of F is gonna be also written D dx C of F. And we know we can pull scalars out when we differentiate. So then we get scalar C times uh, the derivative of F, which is gonna be in the set of all continuous functions because these are all the functions whose derivatives are continuous. So we've shown the second property of linear transformations. So therefore this differential operator is a linear transformation. And we can also take a look at the definite integral operation. So we're gonna let P be the vector space of all polynomial functions. And we are gonna show that the definite integral operator that maps polynomials to real numbers defined by T of P equals the integral from A to B of P of X dx is also a linear transformation. So let's take a look at the first property here. So we know from calculus that you can split up integrals. So the integral from A to B of polynomial P plus polynomial Q of X, we know uh, can be rewritten as uh, the integral from A to B of P of X plus Q of X, all still differentiated with respect to X. And then we know we are allowed to split up integrals over the real numbers. You'll see in future math classes, if your field changes, this might not still be true, but for real numbers, you know you can split up integrals. And um, so we can split this up as uh, the integral from A to B of P of X D of X plus the integral from A to B of Q of X DX, which is exactly just uh, function T of P plus function T of Q. So we've shown the first property of linear transformations. And now let's take a look at the second property. So we're gonna look at T of a scalar C times polynomial P. So following again, we know from calculus, uh, we can pull that scalar out and have scalar C times P of X, uh, all integrated from A to B with respect to DX. And then we know we can pull scalars out in front of integrals without changing the calculations. And so we end up with C multiplied by our uh, mapping T of P. So we've shown the second property of linear transformation. So we showed that this uh, function or mapping T of P equals the integral from A to B of uh, P of X dx, where P is the vector space of all polynomial functions, is in fact a linear transformation from the set of polynomial functions onto the real numbers. And it's onto the real numbers because the uh, definite integral gives us a numerical value. All right, so in the next set of videos, we'll take a look at chapter 6.2.